Yay, it worked. Okay, cool. Woo. All right. Thank you. You're too kind. Um, hello, my name is Divya Sasidharan. Um, you can find me everywhere online at Short Div. I usually go by Divya, so that's usually what it is. But Short Div, there's a story behind it if you're interested. I can tell you later. Um, and I'm a developer advocate at Netlify. I work for Netlify, um, but this talk is not general. It's, it's kind of like about the Jamstack in general rather than just about Netlify. There will be pieces where I talk about Netlify. Obviously, I work for them, so there will be some pitches, but like, don't feel, if it's too like hardball, like let me know and yeah, okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the Jamstack and I feel like this is a repetition. I wish I'd known that the beginning of this will be talking about the Jamstack because I'm going to be talking about the Jamstack, so bear with me. Um, so the talk is about turning the static dynamic. And if we want to talk about static, um, a good question, a good first question when we think about moving from static to dynamic is to think about what exactly static means. Um, and to think about what exactly static means, you usually look at the corollary to static, which is dynamic. And that generally is how we think about static. We're like, something that's static is not dynamic. And I think there's, there tends to be a misnomer between static and dynamic, because there are words, and words are difficult, and people name things in a way that is like hard to understand. So when we talk about something that is static, usually people think, because it's static, it cannot be dynamic, which is not true. And that's basically because when we talk about static, we tend to think client-side render apps. And when we think dynamic, we think server-side rendered apps. That's generally how people think of them. Um, but I want you to move away from this in a sense and think of like client-side as doing a lot more. So we're not going to be talking about server-side apps. We're going to be talking about client-side client applications. And I want you to like not think about dynamic as server-side. Think as, of dynamic as like an app that does many things. Um, and so a client-side rendered app, which is what you see on the left, is can be made to be dynamic in a sense, and if arguably is dynamic. And so the nice thing about a static site is that it's secure, it's fast, it's flexible, it's scalable. Um, I would go into detail on what all of these mean, um, but if you've used a static site, it's really nice because um, if you've built anything with WordPress, usually that means building things with plugins and plugins are very vulnerable because you have to update them. And if you don't update them, there's security vulnerabilities which makes your website susceptible to attacks and so on fast because if you build statically, you don't have to build a backend. And so when you build, you, you can easily just build the layers really quickly and you can deploy it and you can go from like prototype to, the, to production quite quickly. And then flexible and scalable is similar because your application architecture is very lightweight. You can quickly scale and make changes and because everything is pretty much a plug and play framework. And so when I say static, that's basically what I mean. And so when you move a website, when you, when you create something that's static, that usually involves like static site generators. So there are a lot of static site generators out there. There is like Nux, there is um, Next, there's Jekyll. Jekyll is one that's really popular. Hugo is another one. And there's various ways for you to build static websites. And so when you build a static website, essentially um, all of these static site generators kind of have this idea of the gem stack. And I feel like the Jamstack, as was mentioned earlier, is like this new way of thinking about static sites. Because as I was mentioning earlier, whenever people talk about static sites, they're like, oh, it's just HTML, it doesn't do anything. And that's not true because yes, it's just HTML, but it can make an API call. There's, it can use JavaScript to make it a bit more dynamic. So there's lots of things that a static, an otherwise static website can do. And that's where the Jamstack comes in, or that's where the renaming of static sites to kind of move away from the static dynamic perspective. I know this talk is called moving static to dynamic, but Jamstack is kind of an all encompassing term for that, in a sense. And so like, I like to think of jam as like stacked jam, because I like jam. Um, but I also like Jamstack because of the architecture that it is. Um, it's essentially JavaScript API and markup. And all of these encompass like what I mean when I talk about a Jamstack app or a static, a dynamically static application. Very confusing, I know. Um, but let's go into like the architecture of what I mean when I talk about the Jamstack. So here we have like a general build. And then within that, we have something like markup and maybe some JavaScript. So markup being like basic HTML, maybe sometimes markdown. And then JavaScript, which like you can either for templating, 
or for your build structure if you're using NPM scripts and so on. And so with some markup and some JavaScript, you can output a really nice website really well. Um, if you look at a static site generator like Next or Nux, it, it pretty much does this. It gives you HTML, it gives you some JavaScript, and then you have a website out of the box. Um, and then the A in Jam comes in because you have this ability to call APIs. And APIs is really nice because it gives you the sense of slurping content into your website and then like slurping content into your build and then spitting out a website. So if you think of like your general WordPress architecture, which is, which is really great. Um, WordPress has an ability, has a REST API that you can call. So if you were to use the CMS, for instance, to still create content using the WordPress CMS, you can grab content that you created and then put it into a site that's built using ViewPress or React Static or Gatsby. And you can still get a website that's static without you having to manage it, manage a backend or worry about any security vulnerabilities that happen when you build a full stack application. And so, of course, the, the other nice thing is that not only is APIs nice for slurping content and creating a website, it also, you can also bring it back. So a website that's already built can make API calls because the browser allows you to make, use JavaScript. And with JavaScript, you can make requests, you can do posts, you can do edit, you can do delete. And so you can make a request to an API to update content, the content gets updated, and then that content kind of feeds back into your website and updates it appropriately. So again, you're not managing your entire like application architecture because they're all in different pieces. And essentially it's this idea of services. And so you're calling those services and then the services give you back content that you can then use to build your application or your website. Um, and the nice thing about an API is it doesn't have to be a single API call. You can make multiple API calls. So like my, when, my, when I mentioned like a WordPress REST API, that's one example of it. But let's say you have database, like a database in Fire, like you're using Firebase for storing data. That's another API call that you can make and so on. And so you're not limited to just one API call or you're not limited to a specific technology. So again, like I, I hate to like rail on WordPress. I feel like I am right now. I don't mean to, it's just like the one thing that comes to mind at the moment. Um, but if you were to use like WordPress, um, I guess like uh, Drupal is another example. Uh, you would be fixed within that ecosystem. So you would have to use plugins within that framework in order for things to work. Or you would have to build something in PHP within that framework again in order for it to work. But if you were to build something within this Jamstack style, style architecture, you're not limited to technology and you're not limited to a specific ecosystem because everything is pretty much open and available to you. And so that's what people mean when they say decoupled because your application is no longer like a giant stack that like are a monolith as some people call it. It's now decoupled because there is this site, it's super lightweight, it has various calls and API calls you can make to other services and so on. So you can manage those services individually and your site without having to worry about one change, kind of creating a chain effect where if you make a change here, your entire site no longer builds, which happens sometimes. And so that's where the concept of going dynamic is. So in a sense, like it's kind of a blurry term, like this static and dynamic, because a static site in a sense is dynamic as is. Like static, I guess, if you think about it, is just markup and then maybe some JavaScript and then dynamic is like JavaScript and API. So if you wanna think about that, maybe that's the case. But for me, when I think about static and dynamic, the differences between them are fairly blurred. Um, and so as we talk through this, I'm gonna just explain um, how exactly to take something that's fairly like static, which is like just HTML, so nothing else, and move it to something where it's actually building or working very much like what you would think a full stack application works. And so there are various pieces that you can have for that. Build automation is one, event triggers is another, API calls and serverless. The last two points are fairly similar um, and so like, again, we'll, we'll go through it as, as, as the talk progresses. And so build automation is one thing that makes a static, a dynamic website very useful. Um, so for example, when you use Netlify, you essentially have a build. And then when you use like Yarn or NPM, you're building a site locally onto your machine. So whenever you build and work on things, 
generally you're using like a serve function or whatever npm script you, you wrote um, and you're developing locally on your machine the problem with that is that usually when you build locally the local environment is very different from your staging and your production environment because sometimes you have to dockerize your app or like put it on another like server somewhere and you don't exactly know the conditions of how exactly your app will run or what npm version and so on like lots and lots of issues can happen and if you were to build and use this build automation system that generally happens like so if you're using yarn or npm and you build on netlify all you're doing is you're taking the same exact environment and then netlify allows you to do the same thing so your local environment is kind of similar to your staging and production. So you can go directly from your local build to your production build quite quickly. And that automation is really nice because that dynamism of your website, it makes it, makes it building your website much better because you don't have to think about the optimizations that you have to make. You don't have to think about shrink wrapping all your NPM modules, which sucks and so on. And so in order to do this with Netlify, all you're telling Netlify is like giving it a couple of build commands. So you can do this either in Toml, you can do this in the app, like in the dashboard itself, whichever works. And so if you were to use Toml, which is the example that I'm showing you, you're essentially giving a command. So in this case, my command is npm run build, which is what I use on my local machine when I'm building for production. And Netlify knows that that's exactly the same command to run. So all it's doing is it's getting that specific command, it's running it in its own virtual machine. And then that's what gets served up um, from the, the content delivery network, or the CDN, which is what you see at the end. And then obviously you have to give the publish folder. So when you build a command, where exactly it goes to. So if it's a dist folder or a public folder or a build folder, you just tell Netlify where exactly it should expect the assets to go and then that's exactly where I look for when it's serving those assets up and so this is a really quick example that a coworker of mine wrote to just give you a sense of like how quickly and how nice it is to have automation like how to have build automation in your system so the nice thing about static sites is that they're super lightweight and in this case like what's happening is we created a clock that deploys every minute so for every minute, there's a new deploy <laughs> that happens. Um, and so the idea is just like, it's kind of like silly, but it's just to show you how easy it is when you're working within the Jamstack, because you don't have to worry about how, like the length of time that deploys take. Because if you think about like full stack applications or like applications that are much bigger, usually a deploy takes a lot longer. It takes about two minutes, three minutes, sometimes longer. Um, and in this case, a deploy happens every, every minute. Uh, uh, so it just gives you a sense of this idea of build automation that you can build into a Jamstack website um, and it's super robust and very fast and you don't have to worry about anything on, on your end. Um, the other nice thing about a Jamstack or dynamic application is this idea of event triggers. Um, and so an event trigger, if you think about, about it, is similar to the if this then that, which is a company, but it's also an idea because <laughs> It's this idea of like, you want something to happen as a result of something else. So if someone clicks on a button, you want to make an API call, or if someone like submits a form, you want the form to submit and so on. So event triggers can happen in multiple ways. There is form submissions, which is one way of an event trigger. So if someone submits a form, I want some other thing to update. Like if you were doing a poll, if you want, if a user submits information, you want the poll results to update that's an event trigger that can happen. There's build and deploy events. So the blue is, by the way, like things within Netlify and the thing in white is just like anything in the world that is possible. And so build and deploy events is like, in this particular case, if you are deploying to Netlify, you can have event triggers or event hooks that you can hook into. So if, it's a build, if a build is successful, you can grab that specific event and then do something else as a result. You can do um, if a build is unsuccessful and so on. And then split test events is the same where it's this idea of like, if you are using split testing, you can create specific conditionals. So when things happen, you can um, chain events that happen as a result. And then authentication is another, which is just like in the event that someone logs in or logs out or signs up or signs out, 
you can do something else. And I'll show you what I mean by that um, later on in this presentation. Um, and the same for like, you can do the same for content updates. So I mentioned whenever someone updates, let's say you have a blog and you're using WordPress again, um, and you were to update a post or you were to create a new post, you want your blog to update as a result of publishing or editing a post or posting a post. Um, and so that would basically, you could, you could grab that specific event. So like if this specific post, a new post happens, then trigger a new deploy or so on. So you can make sure that events happen in sequence as a result of an event that happened prior. And then it's similar for like, basically event hooks is like kind of the overarching terminology for that. Um, you can do it for Git activity. You can think of like basically anything you can think of is totally possible within this framework. Okay, I really hope this works. Uh, so this is an example of an app that I built. So uh, I work on Vue a lot. Swix works on React and he was supposed to give this talk. So like surprise, I'm giving one on, Re on Vue. Um, and so uh, I created this because I was doing a panel with the core team of Vue and I wanted people to like answer questions or like ask questions that I could then ask the panel because I was asking the panel questions or I was the host. Um, and so this is just like a really quick example of like a form built using Netlify. So if I were to like create a name, Jane Doe, and then I ask um, like, is Vue better than React? Um, I can ask the question and then I think, oh, hold on. I think it goes, yeah. So I, I put it on do not disturb mode so you did not see the pop up. But essentially what is happening is that every time I make a form submission, it updates Slack and it tells Slack like, hey, someone submitted a new event. And so I know exactly as submissions come through when exactly to read them. So it was useful in my specific scenario because I was like on stage asking the panel questions and I needed to be notified when questions came through. So it was useful for that particular case. And of course, like, there's many, many different examples of that, but this is one instance of how you can use event trigger hooks for, for you to like chain different reactions and so on. It's pretty neat. And so APIs is the other cool thing about like using Jamstack. And of course, like APIs is this huge ecosystem. Like APIs is like a catch all term for everything at this point, because there's like, at, I think at this point, there's an API for everything you can possibly think of um, because that's just how it works. So forms is like one, obviously there's search. So Algolia is a really great example. Push notifications if you're using Twilio or whatever, like messaging and so on, authentication with Auth0 and Okta. And like the list just goes on. And headless CMS is like WordPress. And I don't know if Drupal has a headless CMS. Um, but essentially an API just gives you the ability to call that service so you don't have to like bundle it within your application itself. So that service does a thing for you and then you can call it as needed or grab data from it as needed. So you can offload that task to someone else. So authentication is one really good example of this where like I've never built an authentication service. Um, I've worked with auth services and I can't imagine what it's like to build an authentication service from the ground up. Um, but it's really nice if I were to use Auth0 Okta because automatically it gives you the ability to gate your website. So if you're like, this is staging and I, it's super secret and I only want people within my company to see it, I can automatically just put on a widget that locks the website so no one can see it. So that's like a really great example of like how APIs are super useful and give you the ability to make your otherwise static website dynamic without you doing anything. Just like you're making like one API call, maybe including an NPM module at some point, but it's super, super straightforward. And if you're interested in learning more about like all these different APIs and stuff, um, Chris Coyer wrote or like created this website called the power of serverless.info, which is really cool um, because he, it's like a visual and there's various explanations and descriptions about services, pretty much like this list on a website. So you don't have to take notes, it's really nice. Um, because he lists all for every single service, like form handling and authentication, all the available um, 
options that you have when you are looking for that option. So if you want search, Algolia is one and there's multiple others on the site. So he lists a bunch of them. And so serverless is kind of like similar to APIs because serverless is one way of like how you work with an API. But in a sense, serverless is nice because you don't have to create your own server. Um, and I don't like the term serverless because I think it's kind of confusing because it, it's not without a server, it's just not your server. And so the term that I think in general the industry is moving towards is like functions as a service because you're essentially calling a function. So the server exists and the service is you calling the function. Kind of, yeah. So like FAS. So like it's just like a cloud and then the server like lives in the cloud. So you don't use anything. So um, this is a quick example of what I mean. So um, I was very inspired yesterday because I watched the Boston Marathon and like essentially grabbed a bunch of data on like all the runners from 2017 because I couldn't grab data from 2018 or 19. Um, and so like essentially I put that in a Firebase data store. So this is all like coming from Firebase. And so I'm calling Firebase using a serverless function to be like, hey, Firebase, get me data. And it gives me a bunch of data like this. And then these hearts allow me to heart specific runners. I don't actually know these runners, <laughs> um, but um, I can just like increase and increment the number of hearts. And that does a write to the Firebase data store using a function. And so um, if I were to update, it automatically like saves it. So like it's not local to my server. It's not local to my instance. It's just like doing that read and write on the server. So that's super nice. Um, out of the box, I didn't have to do anything. All I did was like create a Fire Firebase instance and then hook it up using some serverless functions. So there's API and serverless. And then the next example, is this the same one? No, it's not. Okay, so the next example is uh, one where um, I mentioned like using identity or actually I did not mention identity, I mentioned authentication. So in Netlify, we call our authentication service identity. Um, it's very similar to anything like AWS has, incog has Cognito, um, and then Okta has Okta, and then Auth0 has Auth0. Uh, and so essentially what you can do is it allows you to create an authentication layer on top of your site. And so I mentioned a little bit about that. So this is kind of what I mean by that. Here I have like just a widget on top of a site that kind of forces me to log in or sign up. And so I can do that uh, quite easily. So I'm logged in and it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, but it's just like the ability to show you that there is an authentication layer on top of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is that the nice thing about authentication and event, like going back to when I was talking about event triggered functions. So when an event happens, I want to be able to grab it and like check or whatever, do conditionals or whatever I want to do. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is I created logic. I'm gonna just run through the code really quickly and give you a visual example before I show you what I'm doing. So essentially when you create an identity instance, you get like a backend where you can see all users. And that's generally, it's not unique to Netlify at all. Like if you're using Auth0, Okta, AWS, you have this where if anyone signs up for your service, you get to see who exactly has signed up for it as a list. So here, obviously I signed up for my own service and no one else. Um, and so you see like, I have multiple emails. Um, and so you might notice, maybe not, cause it's kind of small, that um, essentially what it shows is it shows a name. So like whatever name I gave it, the email that I gave it, as well as a role. And so roles are something that is a concept that comes with authentication, which is like authorization, which is the other piece of authentication. So authentication is like when the TSA agent lets you through the, like, the gates to be like, you can come through because you have a passport or an ID. And authorization is if you can get into like the cockpit of the plane or not, because you're not a pilot. So you can't get into the cockpit. It's like kind of that kind of a concept. So a role is nice because it gives the permissions. So as a website, I can allow you to enter a specific route or not. And so roles come in in that sense. And 
the thing about it is that in general, when you create an authentication service or you use an authentication service, you don't get a role out of the box, like generally, you have to assign that. And so with Netlify, it's the same thing. When a user signs up, they don't get a role because I didn't tell it what role to give it. And so what I wanna do in my serverless function is whenever a user signs up, so I'm using an event triggered function. So when someone signs up, I want to check that person's email. And then if that person's email is at Netlify, give them a role of editor. Does that make sense? So here is my serverless function. I'm really sorry, it's really small. Um, I'll share the slides later so you can look at the code um, a little bit more, but I'll just walk through it like architecturally so you have a sense of what I mean. So um, I have a basic serverless function where I'm grabbing like the event.body, so whatever I'm passing into that serverless function, I'm grabbing that user's email and then all I'm doing is I'm trying to validate that user. So this function that you see is grabbing whatever is the at, like, like person at company.com. So it's grabbing the company.com and it's checking to see whether they're at Netlify.com. And if they are, it sets them as an editor. If they're not, it sets them as a visitor. So this way I can essentially set the user role based on what that person's email is. And then that's basically what it is. And then I send it back as needed. So the response body is essentially what Netlify uses to be like, okay, cool, everything is great. Um, and then the callback. So the piece that is actually what does most of the work is I'm setting the user role and then I'm passing this app metadata back to Netlify because Netlify requires like that metadata to set a, a specific user. So the roles, as you can see, is like where I'm setting the user role and then everything else is like whatever had already been passed through. So I'm essentially like modifying data. So it's like if you're standing, if you're the middleman between two things, so like the form or like the authentication form is trying to pass data to Netlify and I'm standing in between and modifying information as it passes on. So the role is what I'm modifying in this case. Uh, this is wrong, hold on. So yeah, so in this case, just to give you a live example and hope everything works, I'm gonna sign up for my own service uh, at Netlify. And then I will get an email verification at some point, yes. And then here I can confirm my email and then it automatically logs me in and if I go to my dashboard, I will see a new user. Ta-da! Divya at Netlify.com with a role of editor. And that's because the serverless function was setting that for me. So I'm using event trigger functions and I'm using authentication and I'm using a serverless function as well. So that's like one way that you can kind of put everything together. So all the things I talked about is one is like not one recipe, there's so many different ways because there's so many services and so many different like APIs out there um, that there's lots of things that you can do using serverless functions and so on. Um, and so these are just like some examples of it. Um, and I'm more than happy to like talk more about this later if you're interested, um, but that's all I have for now. Um, the slides I will send via the, like I'll post on the meetup, I guess, will be the best way for this. Um, but yeah, and I'm happy to take questions if anyone is interested. Yes? Um, it says that you don't need to worry about shrink wrapping when you're doing these deployments. Yes. Why is that? So um, with Netlify, we pretty much like have, um, I'm not 100% sure in terms of like the internals of what's happening, but uh, you're, they're essentially like, you're running, when you run the build, Netlify is like looking at your package.json and it sees all of the versions. So if you think about it, it's like a virtual machine that's like, okay, grab code, run code, and then it gets all of the static assets and then puts that on the CDN. So like, I think that's a bit different from like, a diff like in, in this sense, like Netlify has a sense of like what your version numbers are. So it keeps that in check. Um, the one thing to that 
where you do need to shrink wrap, so to speak, is if you're using a serverless function and there is a, like, this is, this is a problem that generally happens, like, when you use serverless functions because their um, dependencies is an issue because, like, multiple serverless functions might use, like, different versions of packages. Um, there can be issues in terms of, like, if they live in the same f folder, they might clash because it'd be like, this dependency is different from this dependency. And so you would have to like, not shrink wrap, but you're essentially like zipping the file. So I, I can show you later, <laughs> but like, essentially you're like zipping a specific function folder and then Netlify like basically grabs that and then puts that on the server. So all the dependencies are like wrapped in one module. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, it's a Nel it's yeah, it's not. So that is specifically to Nelfi, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't think so. So like you could do mobile stuff using like app shell and like PWA style way of building things. But I think in terms of like what you're saying, that's not what we're moving. Like, yeah, it, like the way that you're saying in terms of like making API calls and stuff like that seems more like a progressive web app than an actual mobile application. Because an actual mobile application is kind of like everything is self-contained within the sh within like whatever that widget is, yeah. Yeah. I saw that uh, Netlify has a, a bunch of like open source microservice type things um, yeah. on the website, and I was curious: is, is anything you demoed that um, the Go True service? It seems like it's a JSON yeah. that helps with management stuff. Is that anything that you demoed, or can you? Yeah, so I can I can show you an example of that. Um, well, why is this everywhere? So there's a website I built. Hold on, I'm gonna pull up another talk I gave because <laughs> um, I did talk about this at that talk. Um, essentially, with Go True, what you're doing is a bit different. So. Uh, the difference between GoTrue and Netlify identity is that they're the same. <laughs> and so Netlify GoTrue is what happens under the hood of Netlify identity. So identity is like what we call the service and GoTrue is the open source piece of Netlify. Like Netlify identity is what you see when you, you have like the dashboard that shows you all the users logging in and so on. That is identity. It's just like a full baked solution to authentication in your app. Go true is if you want to do everything on your own. So in this case, um, with go true, you would have to handle user sign up, user login, user logout on your own. So like you're still making an API call because that API exists. So you're calling like login, logout, but you have to handle like the JWT token. So whenever a user, uh, essentially what happens is when you log, when you sign up for a service, you sign up and then what the link generator in the email gives you an ID, like a ID that's then used for authentication. So you would have to grab that as a user like clicks. So you would grab it from a URL or something, but you have to manage all of that on your own. And in identity, all of that is done for you. Um, and so essentially like just to give you a sense like visually of what that looks like, um, you, for every piece of the step you would have to do like you would have to create like a function of some form. So like a user signs up and then you would have to call off that sign up. And then when they confirm with an email, you essentially grab the token and any login credentials and then you call off that confirm, which is like explicit. And if you use identity, you don't do that. It, it automatically does it for you. When you, all you have to do is like Netlify identity dot sign, it, sign up or dot login, login and it does it for you. Um, I feel like I had an example of this somewhere. Uh, maybe this. Yeah. 
Uh, no, not this one. Uh, I can't remember where it was. Um, but uh, I can like send you a link to it later on. Yeah, I can. I just like kept losing track of where exactly it is. Um, oh yes, I think this one. It's gonna take a bit to load. Um, but essentially, like the other thing also to note is that you're handling the UI as well. So because you're making all of those API calls, you're handling the UI. So like this is an example of like an implementation of GoTrue where I created everything. <laughs> so like um, I'm gonna log in. Oh, it's very secure. Um, and then like it just gives me a dashboard. Like doesn't do anything crazy, but it shows you the idea of like different layers and pieces you have to plug and play. Um, and then like you obviously can grab the JWT and save it to local storage or like whatever you want to do. Yeah. Is this an example on GitHub at all? Or yes, it is. I, I'll post it. Um, I'll add it to like the links to post. Cool. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I assume, like, if you want to do any user management or see that, you have to build that interface. Just, like, GoTrue is not giving you a. No, so GoTrue doesn't give you any, like, admin interface. Identity would. Um, yeah, so that's the, the only anno annoying thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. I'm just curious about the serverless functions that you're writing. Yeah. Are you managing your project and then finding the like, Yeah, so um, whenever you create a serverless function, you're essentially in the TOML, um, like specifying the f function file name. So in this particular case, I have a function in my root folder. So like this is source, this is root. Um, and so in the build, I'm just telling Netlify where exactly to find that function. Um, and so that's like pretty much all you have to do. It's fairly straightforward. Yeah. 